well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I think some other folks will get uh, uh, to get to join us in a little bit. My name is Sue Ann Tom. I'm the assistant director of the Whitman Public Library, and I want you to I want to thank you for for joining us this evening. We have a great night for uh, you tonight. We're going to talk about digital detox and some more mindful living in the distracted world. Um, we have Dr. Josh Meisner with us tonight, but he prefers to be called Dr. J and considers himself sort of a big kid. He's also an avid Star Wars fan, but we'll talk more about I'm sure all of that as we get along into the evening. I'm going to go ahead and um, sort of step aside tonight, but there's some quick housekeeping. So if you have questions and we'll have time for questions and answers later on, please put your questions into the question and answer section of the Zoom. If you look down at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q and A in the bottom. If you have problems with technology, there's a chat and please put those there. Um, and there's no need to record because we're already recording. So if you have a recording device out, you can go ahead and put down your phone. But aside from that, I'm gonna go ahead and um, minimize my screen and step aside and let uh, Dr. J do uh, his talk for the evening. So thanks so much, Dr. J, welcome. Thank you so much, Sue Ann. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm, I'm just gonna start screen sharing now, just to, um, wrong button, um, just so that, um, Screen share. There is. Boom. There's the title slide. So you should, you all should be seeing the the title slide now. Um, finding stillness in the age of distraction. Um, so the title alone, I feel like it speaks volumes. Um, Finding stillness in the age of distraction. Um, I, I don't know if I actually invented this term or not, but I, I started using this term, the age of distraction. I, I've also seen um, other people use the information age, um, the digital age. Uh, there's been various names for it, but... Um, what I do know is that what we're living in right now is, is possibly one of the largest, most um, revolutionary changes in the way that humans communicate since the dawn of time, since, since humans began to communicate. And so to super briefly, like I could, I could probably go on for an hour about just like the previous revolutions, just to kind of give you an idea of like what, what a revolu communication revolution is and how it's changed things. Um, I think it's really important to go back into history and to take a look at that. So um, when humans first started communicating with one another, I think the very first revolution was um, language. It, it was coming up with something that was more than just nonverbal signals, like, you know, pointing at things or, um, or, or, you know, children, little children grabbing at things that they wanted. Um, people coming up with, with vocal utterances that meant something. And, and they all had shared meaning, right? And so that was probably the first revolution. That changed things because what it did was it allowed people to start getting together and, um, and to start forming tribes. It started allowing them to, um, people who, who, um, communicated very similarly would would gather together. They found that that there was safety in numbers, and that if they all could communicate in the same way, and to do this on a regular basis, that there was that safety in numbers, and that they they wouldn't have to worry so much about all of the the dangers of the world, which I'm sure there were plenty 
back then. Um, the next big revolution, and people, um, we always talk about these revolutions being driven by technology. Um, thinking of writing, the act of writing down a word or typing out a word or whatever, we don't always think about that as a form of technology, but it is. It is a, a writing itself is a form of technology. And it was probably um, prior to developing a, a vocal language, it was one of the ones that, that really thrust humanity forward into um, this complete revolution where um, the, the sharing of writing, the sharing of a written alphabet allowed us to store records. It allowed us to send messages over um, much, much, much longer spaces. It allowed us to um, it allowed us to analyze communication. It allowed us, the things that it allowed us to do had never been done before. And so what's really fascinating for us communication scholars is to look at the, the, the length of time between these revolutions. And what you'll notice as I talk about them is that the, the length of time between revolutions shrinks almost predictably exponentially. Um, it, it, there's so much debate on when vocal communication started. There's, there's even more debate about when written communication started. It's like, okay, well, written communication started about, um, let's say, you know, 2,500, 3,000 years ago in uh, Mesopotamia. And then other debates will be like, well, no, it started much further than that. I mean, look at the paintings at, at the caves in Lascaux. Like, these are, um, even, even artistic paintings are a, for, a form of communication. So uh, do, what do we count? Well, it wasn't until we, we really started to um, change communication technology um, really firmly that we have some pretty firm dates on when those revolutions happened. So um, once writing became kind of accepted, um, and writing, by the way, wasn't always accepted. Um, I wish I had the quote in front of me. I totally should have uh, put this quote in front of me. But Socrates was not a fan of writing. Socrates said that um, that the written word would create a generation of idiots. Those aren't his words. Um, I'm paraphrasing here. But he said that um, by writing, it would take away people's ability to remember things, to, to um, think about things, and to um, process things within their heads. They would just rely on writing for everything. Does this arg argument sound familiar at all? I mean, if it does, then this argument has been raging on for thousands of years. Every time we have one of these revolutions in communication technology, um, we have some group of people resisting against that saying, no, that is going to create a generation of idiots and we're going to lose some part of our humanity. And so far to date, with every revolution that we've had, um, we, we haven't, sure there's been losers. Um, calligraphy, like monks um, that used to recreate the Bible, um, they don't have, there aren't a lot of job openings for monks doing calligraphy to recreate Bibles. So obviously there's some losers, 
Um, but the 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 printing press, which was the next big revolution in communication technology, which interestingly enough happened in um, it happened in Korea and Southeast China first. The problem was um, the alphabet was so complex that um, it, it just wasn't feasible. It wasn't a very solid form of technology. Um, I should have just gone full screen the, the first time. So um, uh, Gutenberg is the one who always gets the credit for coming up with the the printing press um but gutenberg was not by any means um it was about 400 years prior to gutenberg that um the ancient koreans and um southeast china were the ones that came up with the printing press so anyway getting off track gutenberg came up with this idea that he said okay if i make this idea of movable type then I can recreate information on a mass scale. And if I do so, then more people will have access to more information than ever before. So remember when I was talking about whether there's winners and there's losers on um, when it comes to communication technology revolutions, um, who were the losers? It was the monks that were creating the Bibles for the church. Um, and the church was not very happy with Gutenberg for um, printing all of these Bibles and for making them so cheap and for distributing them to all of these people who are reading it for themselves and learning to read for the first time and going, wait a second. Um, I don't have to pay to get into heaven? Like, what was that all about? And of course, Gutenberg's invention, um, many scholars regard Gutenberg's invention as um, the moment of the schism between the Catholic and the Protestant church. And the famous 95 theses um, nailed up to, uh, to the door. Um, so changes in communication technology, um, can quickly, quickly change the world. Well, the next big revolution came during the industrial revolution, and there's too much to even go through there. Um, it started with, um, the, the camera, it, it, and what's really funny is my son always asked me, like, he he went in he googled the the picture of the first camera and he shows it to me and he goes dad how did this happen how how did somebody get a picture of the first camera boom i was like uh because they built two <laughs> oh okay i get it so um Throughout the Industrial Revolution, um, we saw so many improvements to communication. Um, radio was invented, and then radio um, was improved upon by building television. And then all of a sudden, you've got satellites being launched out into space, and you can communicate worldwide. Um, the two most, I've heard it said that the two most important inventions of the entire 20th century the first one was the birth control pill <laughs> because it gave women control that they had never had before and the second main invention was the solid state transistor because what essentially that did um the uh computer before the solid state transistor was built by Intel in roughly 1969, 1970, um, the computers that they had from roughly the mid 30s to the, the late 60s, they were built using vacuum tubes. I mean, these are light bulbs. 
and a, a light bulb being on meant one. A light bulb being off meant zero. And in binary computer language, ones and zeros, that's how computers work. And so computers were expensive. They were huge. Um, if you go out and you Google a picture of the, the world's very first hard drive, it's amazing. It's this IBM hard drive that is being offloaded off of this airplane by a, a forklift. And it has the memory capacity, the, the memory capacity alone of this first hard drive would not even hold one picture from this phone that I hold in my hand. That's how far we've come. Okay, so um, let's start with the story. Um, I, my family went grocery shopping one day and we, we had a pretty big list. So we had multiple stores to go to. And I, um, I don't know why we didn't just find a babysitter for the kids, you know, like most smart parents would have done. But um, we brought the kids with us and um, it was a Saturday and we went to Costco. Who goes to Costco on a Saturday other than apparently the rest of the entire world? And um, when we went to Costco, um, I, I, the, I had a brand new device in my pocket. This was my, my BlackBerry. Uh, I had gotten the BlackBerry because um, I had just been hired for my first teaching job, my first professorship job. And uh, one thing that nobody told me about becoming a professor was the constant flow of email. And so I genuinely felt like I was handcuffed to my desk 24 seven answering emails, emails about meetings, meetings about emails, um, it was just email after email after email. So when I got that first BlackBerry, looked a little something like this. I just had to put in a picture of a BlackBerry. Boy, oh, that tactile screen. I don't know if anybody else misses that, but um, the ability to like just, you know, tap and click and everything that, that was so great to me. Um, but I quickly learned why they call it a crackberry instead of a blackberry because um, I was on that thing like 24 seven. What I hadn't realized was that all I had done was I had traded the time that I was spending in front of my computer answering all those emails at work to staring at this tiny little screen that was in my pocket. My work was now following me around. And the worst part about that was that it was bleeding into my family life. So back to um, what happened at, um, at Costco. This is roughly, um, this is not an actual picture, but this was roughly what Costco looked like that day. Um, I received that ever familiar buzz in my pocket and I thought, you know, oh, somebody's emailing me. I better check it. I was conditioned. It was, I was like Pavlov's dog minus the drool. I was reaching in my pocket for that phone. And so I reach into the pocket. I'm reading while I'm pushing the big orange flatbed cart and suddenly that big orange flatbed cart came to an utter and complete halt. And I knew, okay, one of two things had happened. I had either run into something like, you know, one of the big poles that's in the middle of the aisle that, um, or uh, the, the other option was I, I had run into another human being. And I was sincerely hoping 
that it was not the latter. But when I looked up, I realized it was. There was my wife, and I, I'm going to do my best impression of my wife. It involves, um, you know, putting my glasses down like this. And she looked at me and she said, and pardon my French, this, this is the title of my book. Um, so this explains everything. But she looked down her glasses at me and she said, Josh, put the phone down. She'd had enough. Um, you know, the, the old story about um, putting a frog in water, if you put a frog in cold water and you slowly turn the heat up, it's going to cook the frog before the frog even realizes what happens. But if you take a frog and you throw it in hot water, and all of a sudden the frog knows it's hot water and it jumps right out. Don't know if that's true. That's probably not an experiment anybody should try. But um, that was me um, because I had my, my crackberry for so long, I didn't realize how sucked in I was becoming, how addicted I was becoming to um, checking and clearing all of those notifications, how socially conditioned I was becoming to that ever familiar buzz in my pocket or the ding um, if, if it happened to be on. Um, so after, after my wife made her opinion known, um, a, a, very, a very interesting and heated argument ensued, um, meaning we fought for pretty much the rest of the entire day. And I suddenly realized after this fight that I was sending the wrong message to my family. Um, by having that phone in front of my face all the time. And I don't even know how many times I said, just a sec, just a sec, just a sec to my kids in favor of having that phone in front of my face, um, that message that I was sending to my family was, whatever is on my phone is far more important than you. And that is not the message that I wanted to send to my family. The reason that I was on my phone was um, I was answering those student emails. I remembered what it was like to be a student. I remembered what it was like to be, um, you know, it's 11.45 at night. Uh, you've got an assignment that's due at midnight. You've got a question on it and you email your professor in the hopes that uh, maybe by some chance your professor is also a night owl like you are um, and, and that the professor will respond, well, I, I pride myself on being that professor, on being that urgently responsive person to always be there for my students. But at a sacrifice, um, at, at a pretty serious trade-off, I had traded off um, my, my commitment to my students to my commitment to my family. And that's when I said, you know what? Um, I'm a communication scholar and this is a communication problem. And so I'm gonna do what communication scholars do. I'm gonna research this and I'm gonna look into it and I'm gonna figure out what's going on. So that's what I wanna really share with you today. So in the beginning of that research, um, I ran across this fascinating quote that I really want to draw your attention to the date. Um, most people don't look at the dates of citations and, you know, and, and think, wow, that's a really profound date. But 1989, that was a, that's 32 years ago. Richard Saul Worman said, a weekday edition of the New York Times 
contains more information than the average person was likely to come across in a lifetime in 17th century England. And that was 32 years ago. Can you imagine how much more that has changed? Well, let's see where that's changed. Let's illustrate that even further. So let's give you some perspective. Um, you may have to um, move the, the video preview out of the way to be able to, to see the quotes in their entirety. But um, in 1996, a top of the line computer, and this, this was the top of the line. This was a Pentium 233 megahertz processor. Um, it had a four gigabyte hard drive. It had a 15 inch color monitor. Like I couldn't believe how top of the line this could be. I paid $3,500 for this computer. And looking back on it, I'm like, wow, what was I thinking? I can go to Walmart right now and I can buy a four gigabyte thumb drive for like, $4.99. It is ridiculous how fast technology has driven and how cheap it has become. So now that we have that perspective, um, oops, click there. Um, another experiment that was really fascinating in 2003. Uh, let me check my notes at the San Diego Supercomputer Center Symposium in 2003. This is a group of super smart people who all work on like the highest technology computers that exist in the world. What they did was they said, what if we were to take the entirety of all human speech ever spoken and we were to type it out and we were to save it in a single text file, you know, first of all, that would take a lot of people typing. <laughs> I, and I mean a lot of people, but they said, how big would that be? So they ran this experiment on a supercomputer to see exactly how big that was going to be. And it was big enough to where they had to create a new word for it because a word had not yet existed. Five exabytes. Now, five exabytes, to us, that translates into 5 million terabytes. A terabyte is 1,024 gigabytes. So these are some big, big numbers. Let's put this into perspective. Let's say, OK, um, I'm going to go down to Costco. And of course, I'm going to go on a Saturday, right? because that's when everybody else goes and ends up with broken ankles. Um, and I'm going to buy their entire stock of external hard drives. Um, let's say you can get for about a, a hundred bucks, you can get a good two terabyte hard drive. You're looking at $50,000 and a whole lot of orange flatbed carts to carry that out. And I'm pretty sure you're not taking that home in one truck. You may need a U-Haul to take that sucker home. That's a lot of space. So that's the entirety of human speech ever spoken in text format. Let's crank this up a notch. In 2017, Another company, let me find my notes, called NodeGraph, this is a data store provider, used a supercomputer to compile 
all of the data on the internet. So if this is a question you've ever asked yourself, you've said, I want to know how much information is on the internet, um, because those are the kinds of questions that keep you up like at night, like me. Um, the amount of in data on the internet was 2,700 exabytes, 2.7 billion terabytes. Okay, that now let's consider time. We've got hundreds of thousands, even millions of years because um, it's really hard to predict um, when human speech started to be spoken. Uh, there, like I said, there's a lot of arguments about that, but it went from 5 million terabytes to 2.7 billion terabytes in a short matter of time. So this is growing. If there's a word that's stronger than exponential, and I don't know what it is, I should totally look it up, but um, this, this is incredible, the amount of data that we're producing. Now let me blow your mind even more. In four more years, that almost sounded like a political slogan, but it wasn't. In four more years, all of humanity predicted will have digitally created and stored 175 zettabytes. We've had to create yet another new word for this. And a zettabyte is 175 trillion terabytes. The cost of that at Costco on a Saturday, of a super busy Saturday, even if they had that many, would be close to $1.8 trillion to store the amount of data that all of humanity will have digitally created and stored. That doesn't mean that it's all good. That doesn't mean that it's all um, Newton's third law of thermodynamics. That doesn't mean that it's Einstein's theory of relativity. That could just be a cute cat meme. I mean, it could be anything. We're not talking about quality of information. We're talking about quantity inform of information. And let me give you another idea of how big this is. For one person to download everything that's been digitally created and stored by the year 2025, it would take 1.8 billion years at the fastest fiber optic rate of download that we know exists. This is stuff that's only available to the government. 1.8 nearly 2 billion years. I looked it up right before this presentation to make sure that my memory hadn't failed me from taking Anthropology 101 as an undergraduate. Homo sapiens have only been around for 200,000 years. That is crazy. That is mind-blowing. It's often been said that... Um, Trying to take a drink of water from the internet is like trying to take a drink of water from a fire hose. And that is full blast right there. So if you're starting to feel a little bit overwhelmed like I am, that's fine. Um, we can also take another look at what else is going on because um, this is just numbers. This is just numbers on a screen. So let's talk about something called mean world syndrome. This was something that was created by a guy named George Gerbner. He was a communication theorist. Um, in 1968, he got a massive grant from the U.S. government, um, and he created what was called the Cultural Indicators Project. His project was to study television and its effect on people. 
because in, in the year 1968, that's when they were really starting to figure out, look, watching TV is having an effect on people. It's changing the way that people vote. It's changing the way people buy things. It's even changing the way that they act culturally. And so um, within this study, this long study, longitudinal study on screen time, what he found was in three groups of TV viewers, one was a light group of TV viewers. They consumed less than two hours a day. Good for them. They watched maybe a, a few shows a day, but for the most part, the TV stayed off. Then you had the medium viewers, two to four hours a day. Then you had the people who had like, you, I don't know if anybody remembers this, they had like the TV dinner tray that sat on, you know, in front of you. Um, they watched more than four hours of TV a day. So they, they divided them up into these three categories and they studied them. They said, okay, what's going on with these people? And one of the most amazing conclusions from this longitudinal study was that those who watched moderate to large amounts of television were talking greater than four hours a day, they actually believed that the world was a more dangerous place than it actually was. It created a fear in them. And the reason why was because the shows that they were watching on TV, they're drama shows, they're cop dramas, they're legal dramas, they're hospital dramas, and everything is dramatic, right? And so they are, that's, if that's all they're consuming, then their brain is interpreting that as reality. And so um, there's been a lot of people who are, are now taking this research and saying, you know what? I think that we can apply this to social media too and say that people who are using social media are starting to have an extremely warped view of the world around them. And nowhere do I think that's more evident than the realm of politics. It has divided the world of politics into camps that are more divided than they ever have been in history. Let's also point out that the current average US screen time per day is six to seven hours. Compare that to the heavy users of four hours a day. That's compelling. That is interesting and it is telling us something about ourselves. So um, I want to play a very, very brief video from you. Um, this is from some of the work of Nicholas Carr. He wrote the book, um, The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains. And I think that it plays pretty heavily into um, what's going on here, in, into the, the actual changes that, that we're seeing. So you're reading an article online when you get an instant message with a link to a funny photo, which of course you have to share. And now you're reading your Facebook news wall, which sends you to a video of a panda bear attacking a kid. And now you're reading Wikipedia to learn everything you can about the violent behavior of panda bears. And this is what three minutes on the internet can be like. We live like this all the time, and it has to have some kind of effect on us. The net is making us more superficial as thinkers. That is Nicholas Carr. He is the author of The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains. To understand this whole thing better, we need to go way back in time to say like the prehistoric age. You wanted to know everything going on around you because the more you knew about your surroundings, the less likely you were to get attacked by a predator. And there's even evidence that our brains release some dopamine, pleasure producing uh, neurotransmitter 
chemical to reward us for seeking out and finding new information. So getting distracted felt good and helped us stay alive. But the problem is that nowadays, predators aren't much of an issue, but we still have the same brains. And also, there's the internet, which is... It's an incredibly information-rich environment uh, that the net creates for us, and that's why we use it so much. I, I mean, sounds, pictures, words, text. And what this tends to do is, is promote a sort of compulsive behavior in which we're constantly checking our smartphone, constantly glancing at our email inbox. We're kind of living in this perpetual state of distraction and interruption. Which is dangerous because... That mode of thinking crowds out the more contemplative, calmer modes of thinking. And that focused, calm thinking is actually how we learn. It's a process called memory consolidation. And that means the transfer of information from our short-term working memory to our long-term memory. And it's through moving information from your working memory to your long-term memory that you create connections between that information and everything else you know. So you've got this awesome life-changing piece of information in your short-term memory, but then you hear that email ding and poof, there it goes. That email takes its place and you never get a chance to learn anything, all because of one distraction. So attention is the key. And if we lose control of our attention or are constantly dividing our attention, uh, then we don't really enjoy that consolidation process. But I can hear it now. Someone out there is saying, uh, what does learning matter if all the information in the world is just a Google search away? Well, um, that is kind of shortchanging our intellects. If that's the way you're using your mind, just kind of searching very quickly and finding information and then forgetting it very quickly, you're never building knowledge. You're simply, you're, you're kind of thinking like a computer. Which means that our very humanity is at stake. And it would be a shame if we all got assimilated because, well, humanity is pretty neat. I really believe that if you look at the great monuments of, of culture, they come from people who are able to pay attention, who control their mind. That's what allows us to think in the highest terms, and think conceptually, think critically, uh, think in some very creative ways. And it's this kind of thinking that's at risk, being eroded one cute cat video at a time. Don't get us wrong, the internet is good for lots of things and it should be celebrated. But the best thing we can do for our minds is to find some time every day to unplug, calm down, and focus on one thing at a time. Your email and those cats will be here when you get back. All right, I'll stop it there. Let's um, briefly talk about mindfulness because um, one of the, the main points of the video was attentiveness and mindfulness, um, not quite the same as attentiveness, um, but extremely closely related. There are four components to mindfulness um, and all four components have to be present to be fully mindful and to, uh, to be fully present and to take in the moment as it is happening and to truly be attentive to that moment. Um, the, as far as the four components, number one, duh, it's present focused and aware. I'm aware of what's going on around me. I'm not being distracted by anything. I am fully aware of what's going on in the present. However, that has to be intentional. It has to be by choice. We have to make the decision to be present, focused, and aware. I can be um, talking on this Zoom call, and all of a sudden, somebody um, comes and knocks on my door, or um, my phone, my office phone rings. All of a sudden, my attention is being drugged in other places. Um, unintentionally. That isn't mindfulness. That isn't, um, that's attentiveness, but it's not mindfulness. The third component, <clears throat> excuse me, is the ability to notice novel developments as they arise. So as things start to happen in the moment, you are noticing it. 
And so the example that I always use is if I'm sitting on my front porch on an autumn day and um, I'm present focused, I'm doing it on purpose, and I see a single maple leaf let go of the tree for the last time and it just drifts to the ground. And I'm thinking so poetically about that leaf. I have noticed something new that has happened in the moment. The last part and the hardest part is non-judgmental acceptance. When we are in the moment, when that leaf is falling, um, I have to be able to accept that what is happening is just happening. It is neither good nor bad. Um, I'm not placing value judgments on it. I'm not thinking of it as, oh man, that sucks. That's one more leaf to hit my lawn and I'm going to have to rake it next week. Or it could be positive. It could be, I'm going to write a poem about this moment because it is so stunningly beautiful. And in fact, I'm going to start writing it now. What's happening in both of those scenarios is it's pulling you out of the moment and suddenly it's making you think of things that have nothing to do with that moment. And so you have to be able to non-judgmentally accept that that is what is happening at, in the moment, at, at that exact moment. So how do we do this? Regular digital detoxes promote more mindful digital consumption. And the way that they do this is by disrupting the conditioning process. Remember earlier when I said when um, that familiar buzz happens in my pocket or ding, um, that ding is the conditioning. It is Pavlov's bell. It is designed to be that way. If you really want to scare the crap out of yourself, and if you haven't already, go watch The Social Dilemma on Netflix. The, the designers, the engineers behind these technologies have designed them to be addictive. They have worked with psychologists to make sure that they are addictive. And so for you to detox, you are taking back control. You, what you're doing is you, by disrupting that conditioning process, what you're doing is um, you're allowing yourself choice. You're allowing yourself control. And so I have one last story. Um, I was home. I remember I was doing work. It was a rainy day. Um, I had a lot of grading to do. Um, I mostly had a lot of emails to do too, uh, if I'm being honest, but I'm sitting there and I'm grading and my kids are driving me nuts because it's a rainy day. They don't want to go play outside in the rain like what kid does, right? Okay, maybe some kids do, but my kids did not. And so they came to me and they're like, dad, help, we're bored, we're bored, we're bored. And they annoyed me enough until I said, fine, I'm going to put the grading away. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to figure out um, something that we can do that doesn't cost any money because let's be honest, I was broke at the time. Um, let's figure out something that uses our imaginations and let's figure out something memorable. What we ended up doing was we gathered up all of the cardboard in the house. We, um, we went out, we bought one or two rolls of duct tape. 
and we came home and in our basement we built what i think and i'm not sure but i think this is the world's only working ski ball game made fully out of cardboard and if somebody else has made it i, I don't want to know um but this was the result of our efforts To date, that is one of my kids' favorite memories. And yes, I did record it on my phone and I have no regrets for doing that because that was one of those moments that I wanted to capture. Um, but you'll notice it's a short video. I didn't sit there and I didn't record it the entire time. What digital detox is is it's about balance. It's about um, figuring out uh, how I can return control to myself over my device, um, but at the same time, use it because technology is amazing. Look at us. We're having a Zoom conversation about the addiction, the potential addiction of technology that that's amazing to me and somewhat ironic at the same time. Um, but the important part is to do it regularly and stick to it. It's having no phone family meals. It's having what we call screen free Saturdays. And I, yes, my wife gave me permission to do this on a Saturday. And she said, you better work that into it because I, I want the people who are watching this to know that um, they should appreciate the fact that you are on your electronic device on a screen-free Saturday. But the important thing is to do it regularly. It's to do it so that you continue to disrupt that conditioning because it is in doing so that we in turn to use our tools rather to, than to allow our tools to use us. Thank you very much. I would like to open it up for questions now. I'm looking at the time. I probably took way too much and I'm so sorry for that. Um, but I, I love, this topic i really really do so um sue do you have any questions do you have um any any further topics that that we can explore as a result of what we've talked about today yes oh my gosh dr j yes Thank you so much. And for those of you who are in the audience, if you have questions, please put your questions in the uh, question and answer section of the um, Zoom, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. So um, I see somebody has just put something into the chat, which is, will you be able to record this? This is already being recorded. So this will be available on Whitman Hansen Cable Access. So that will be coming um, just as soon as we've had a chance to do um, some editing. But if you have questions for Dr. J, yes, he's going to take those now. So please put them in the question and answer. But yes. Yes, I, I do have some follow-up questions. I just have to say, I love the fact that you put up the BlackBerry and I wanna thank you for that. Because one of my very first repetitive use injuries in my twenties was for BlackBerry thumb. And I spent oh, six, six oh, weeks. So bad. Yeah, six weeks in a cast with um, with that. So the, the struggle is very real, but you, you did talk about this need to disrupt the, um, the digital addiction. And when you're talking about trying to get out of going down this, this rabbit hole where you'll, you'll get onto the internet or you'll get into TV or you'll get into 
whatever it is. And you talked about screen free, screen free Saturday. Yes, thank you for being here or whatever it is. You know, <laughs> what are some of the things um, that we all can do today? right now and sort of that's one question and then what are some of the other physical signs that we are addicted i mean obviously i you know we have these these thumbs or whatever it is that might actually hurt so what can we do today and then what are some of the signs that you know we're actually maybe like physically hurting that we may not even know so that's right, where I would right, start. And again, right. if you have questions, please be uh, be sure to throw them into the question and answer. Thank you. Those are those are absolutely fantastic questions. I'd say the number one thing that you can do, um, other than uh, making sure that you disrupt the whole process uh, by taking time off, by making it intentional, and um, and and as you make it intentional. I want you to notice how uncomfortable it feels. This is something that I didn't even mention. I think I may have mentioned it in my TED talk, um, but the very first screen-free Saturday, um, oh, I feel I feel like such a tool for for even admitting to this. Um, I snuck off to the bathroom. I locked the door, I, I grabbed my phone, I sat on the edge of the tub and I cleared my emails. In the bathroom? In the bathroom. <laughs> and I felt so bad for it, Sue. I, I was like, this, I feel like a drug addict right now. I feel like I'm getting my fix. I am in the bathroom on the edge of the tub clearing email what is going on with myself mm -hmm. and so um as you do um these um these disruptions um it, however they may look um i i want you to take the time to intentionally notice what is the difference um, one of my favorite ones that I've heard uh, is like when friends, let's say you've got five or six friends, which is probably, you know, like um, five or six more than I have, but um, <laughs> you, you go out to dinner. I'm imagining this, you know, like, hey, what would a friend dinner look like? Um, and you, you all go out to dinner and everybody puts their phones in the center of the table. And the, the agreement is first one that reaches for their phone gets the check. Nice. You do something like that and you're going to have people who are like, mm, like you're going to, you're going to hear buzzes. And it, it, the best part is, is if you leave the screen up so they can see who it's from. And then they're like, oh, this is really important. I got to take this. Oh, well, it looks like you're taking the check too. Mm -hmm. um, or another one is, um, oh, where was I going to go with this? Uh, I, think, I think the biggest thing is, is to really just to notice how it feels. And um, if if you start to feel a need, if you start to feel an urge to go check your phone, then that's a really good sign that you've got a problem. If you are standing in line in Costco on a Saturday and um, instead of looking around and maybe even striking up a conversation with a fellow patron, do you remember when we used to do that? <laughs> right it exactly. happened right. believe it or not it happened people talked to one another in line that's right people people would be like oh hey where did you get that and they would they would point at your your orange chicken or whatever oh it's, <laughs> it's way back in the frozen foods aisle. like can you save my spot i'm gonna go back and i'm gonna go get some right. like people used to do that and now what they do is um, we had to invent another new word for this one, fubbing. 
the art of phone snubbing, where you pull your phone out of your pocket so that you don't have to talk to strangers. That's right. Yes, or on the on the airplane, so that so that people, you know, yes. you've got the things in your ears, so that may, right. Yeah. Yes. Mm. And and so what I would challenge you to do is. Um, not all of these things are bad. You know, sometimes you just don't feel like talking to nobody. Like I'm at, I'm at Costco and I'm waiting for my pizza. And I promise you, this is not just one big advertisement for Costco. <laughs> um, but, but that's, that is where I spend a lot of my time. So uh, I'm, I'm waiting for pizza. I'm playing Pokemon Go. I'm killing time. I really don't feel like talking to anyone because it's been a long day and I just want to get my dinner and I just want to get out. Like, it, yeah, do it. it. It's fine. Don't, you shouldn't feel guilty about doing that. Um, I think the key is in balance. It's in finding a balance between knowing when to use time technology and knowing when not to use technology because you are going to get um, far richer conversation from people in person than you are on text. And I don't think that it takes um, a rocket surgeon to be able to figure that out. I don't think that, that any one of us would disagree with that because you get two people together talking, um, it, it's, it, it is going to eclipse your text-to-text -text conversation. Um, I have made it a point, um, my, my last day of work, sadly, uh, after 13 years of teaching at North Idaho College, my last day of work is Tuesday. And I'm like looking around in my office. I'm going, oh, I got to pack up my office. Um, for the last two weeks, you know what I've found in myself? You know what I've found myself doing? Mm. I have found myself every time one of my colleagues texts me, I, I say, do you have time for a call? And, and, and I take the time to hear their voice. Um, the other day, I... I I had something come up and I got up off my lazy butt and I walked across campus to my colleague's office just so that I could sit with her and talk. And it was so nice. Um, I think that we, as technology develops, um, we're not gonna see any of this going away by the, by the way where it's only going to get better it's only going to get more efficient um maybe now with all of the previous revolutions we have found a way to adapt we've we, you know like um take the books one for example are there calligraphers around yeah yeah they're still around they're doing weddings they're, they're doing announcements for graduations. They're, you know, they're employed. They're doing work. Is it as big as what they used to be doing for the, the Catholic Church in copying Bibles and getting paid extremely handsomely for it? No, it's not. It's just a matter of adapting. So, um, the question is, how are we going to adapt? Um, nobody knows what the world looks like tomorrow, let alone five, 10 years from now. Um, so uh, just be prepared for it and, and find your way to, to reclaim your humanity and to remember that, that this... Huh, what, what is that? You're holding it? Oh, you, you can't even see the phone because no no what is it it's, it's visible <laughs> oh it's a phone okay a, <laughs> oh there's a phone gone so well, I, I, I was I, I wasn't gonna hold up the front of it just in oh because there's probably notifications on it but yeah there's my phone there's hey there's my wife there you go so, well, you know in um, this phone i was thinking of 
one of the the apps that came up that really sort of terrified me and again if there's questions from our audience please throw them up in the in the q a one of the the apps that was really terrifying for me in the last year or so was this thing with the screen time um oh. and the amount of the screen time and if anybody oh. else has seen this um please join in the amount of screen time, because I was under the um, illusion that I really was not on this thing all that much. I thought this was great and I was doing really well. And that wasn't, you know, different for my kids, you know, which totally different. Um, but I thought it's great. I'm doing great. I hardly ever look at this. And then, you know, Apple comes up with something and, um, all of a sudden I, I get this notification that I'm on it, some sort of percentage of, have you seen this, this, this? Oh world? yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, can you talk about, there are now apps that tell us how often we're on this. So again, part of this detoxing uh, of this, where, where we, there's even an app that is trying to notify us about how much time we're spending on the phone. Um, and anyway, please, Hal, okay. speak, speak to this. First of all, don't freak out about the time, okay? <laughs> um, the, the overall time, well, okay, freak out about the time a little bit, um, but don't freak out about the time too much. It takes some drilling down because as I start drilling down, I start to realize, okay, um, the majority of my time I'm spending on um, text messaging, I'm spending on phone calls, I'm spending on emails, like um, I'm being productive, like I'm using my phone for what it's designed for. But if you drill down and, um, oh my gosh, I'm trying to think of something more relevant, but angry birds is the only thing coming to mind right now. So I apologize. If Angry Birds or Pokemon Go is at the top of your list. Uh, it could even just be a spiral of, you know, one wiki article leads to the mm -hmm. next wiki article yeah, leads yeah, to yeah. the next, you know, just sort of the, the, it all just leads to the next thing. It doesn't necessarily have, and this is no judgment to whatever anyone is, is reading. My question for you is, how do we pull back from that? And I think with this leading to those, those you know, that, that disruption of a sleep cycle, that repetitive use injury, mm -hmm. that sort of general disengagement from where we are, that, what did you call it? Uh, snubbing, uh, flubbing, Bubbing. right. That not, again, the, see the short term, not even being able, you just, you, you literally ding, just, ding. right. You just <laughs> said it, you just said it. So that's what I mean. Being able to not even remember what you just, you just said a moment ago. How do we, how do we stop that spiral? Gosh, that's, it's a big question. And I wish I had like the giant answer for it. Um, I have a situational example for you uh, that has been weighing extremely heavily on my mind for quite a while. And um, I think it had to do with the video that I shared with you um, when Nicholas Carr talks about how um, if, if all you're doing is you're just, you're looking stuff up, you're looking stuff up and you're forgetting it a, a second later, you, all you're, all, you're just a search engine. That's it, that's all you are. I noticed the other day, my son, uh, my 13 year old son, he came up with the most interesting question. He said, um, he said, dad, how many people do you think have ever lived on this planet? We, we happened to be watching Endgame at the time and we were thinking about the Thanos snap and we were like, what would the max Thanos snap be? Like if everybody was alive all at the same time, like we're nerds, sorry. Um, and so if none of this rings a bell with you, <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> I, but, I get um, <laughs> he, he immediately pulled his phone out and he Googled it and he got an answer. And guess what? I don't remember it. I don't remember how many people have been on earth. I, I know it was in the billions. 
Um, it, and it was up there. It was like 90 billion or something like that. Um, but then I started thinking about what were the old days like? What, what were the old days like? So in sixth grade, I had this teacher, um, one, of the, one of my favorite teachers, Mr. Ray, he was so cool. He was a 22 year old fresh out of college. He had all the energy in the world. He had none of the cynicism that comes with, um, you know, having taught for 30 years in um, sixth grade or whatever. But he, he had this giant Jeopardy wall on the back of his classroom and it was filled with questions and the questions he got from Trivial Pursuit. And he said, okay, every Thursday, we're gonna, we're gonna take turns. Um, we're gonna go down the list. We're gonna see, okay, does anybody have a question to answer? If you answer it and each one had a point value on it and the point value um, was the number of Twizzlers you got for answering the question correctly. And to me, that was the coolest thing in the world. And I'm like, I'm spending all of my time in the library. I am answering every question because I freaking love Twizzlers. Twizzlers <laughs> are bomb. Like I love me some Twizzlers. So um, I'll never forget that process. And, and I compared that to what I went through with my son and what would my son have had to do? He would have had to go to where you are. He would have had to go to a library. He would have had to look it up. He would have had to find a book. One of those scary, scary things <laughs> bound by a paper right. um, with weight that if you drop it on your foot, it could hurt your toe or something like, I don't know why people are so afraid of books anymore, but I, it would have looked totally different for him to answer that question in a pre-digital world. Um, and so I, I, I think I'm going to take that as, as one of my next um, challenges is to figure out, okay, how can we do this? How can we use our existing tools to, because the, the access to information we have is amazing. The things I can say, hey, Siri too, and you didn't answer, did you? Okay, she didn't answer. <laughs> the things that can say that to her and have her pull up are astounding. Um, how can I use that to my advantage? And actually learn and retain something? How can I use that to, um, to become a better person? How can I use that? Um, how can I use that to help others? I, and, and I don't know the answer to that yet, but I think that's going to be one of the next challenges that, that I take on is like, um, his point about becoming the machines that we're using terrifies me. And how do we remain, how do we retain our humanity? Um, how, how do we use our tools without them using us? And so I think that's the bigger question at, at Bay here. And um, I, I think that's, that's the one that I'm probably going to spend like the next 20 years working on. Yeah. Well, I think that that's a good place actually for us to leave it for tonight, unless there's any questions from the audience. Um, I think that's where that's where we'll leave it. You've given us a lot to think about. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us tonight. Um, thank you to Paul Hansen from Whitman ha uh, Hansen Cable Access. Thank you, Dr. Josh Meisner. And uh, thank you for everyone who joined us tonight, wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much and um, be well. Everyone from the Whitman Public Library, I'm Sue Ann Tom and have a wonderful evening, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity. Um, I love having conversations like this. <laughs> it was wonderful 
Um, even if it was just hearing myself talk, thank you so much for the opportunity. Okay. And um, if I had one piece of advice for you, it would be to challenge yourself, challenge yourself to do something like this. Think about it. Okay. Um, think about it as, as you go on about the rest of your weekend. How can I do things differently? Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you. So we're right. off to do it. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thanks Have a good night. Bye. Bye.